You know, these diesel engines are mighty expensive. For the price of a four-unit diesel, you could buy 150 Cadillacs. When you get a burn-up diesel unit, you generally have road delays and a lot of money down the drain. A fire-damaged diesel cannot haul trains and cannot earn money to pay your wages. Now you've all had some previous instruction on fighting locomotive cars. But we thought we'd go a ways further in this film and show you how to cope with most any situation. You probably will not have a farm. But if you do, we want you to know what in blazes goes on. From the beginning, the heart of a locomotive was a roaring fire harnessed for steam power. An engine was nothing but a furnace on wheels, and the fireman had to bail in a lot of coal to keep the old girl hot. Each advance in steam engine design produced more power out of the essential fire. The diesel engine has packed the old railroad flames into a fuel injection flash. And the introduction of electricity put the power in overhead wires. Yes, the electrics and diesels are taking over. Fire is a die-hard. It doesn't like being put off the railroad, and it has a way of coming back. Got a fire alarm, Bill. What's the story behind fires like this? Gentlemen, I have here the photograph on, of the fire on 5715A. That's the one that was on fire up near View last week, isn't it, Bill? That's right, Dick. I also have the engineman's statement on the fire on this locomotive. I attempted to use the CO2 extinguisher, but the smoke was too thick. I did not operate the CO2 valve the high voltage cabinet. Gentlemen, here it is again. On this particular locomotive, there is a CO2 nozzle built right into the high voltage cabinet. But apparently in this fire, he did not know where it was. Well, what you say, Bill, is borne out by some of the units we've taken into the shop with fire damage. A few of them haven't had the fire extinguishing system used at all and others have had the dry powder used where the CO2 would have done a better job. 
We have endeavored to instruct the crews thoroughly. But some of these engine crews have worked on diesel locomotives for a number of years without any actual experience with a fire. And when a fire does occur, sometimes they do not do the right thing at the right time. I believe this all boils down to three things that we're going to have to get across to our engine crews. First, the kind of fires that are likely to occur. Second, the equipment that is available for their use. And third, the methods which should be employed to put those fires out fast. Well, the means to go after a traction motor fire is quite different from the method of going after a, a cabinet fire. Oh, that's true. I think we would all be satisfied that we could keep these little fires from becoming big ones. It's that simple. And there's no reason why we can't lick this thing. No, there's no reason. Not when you know what causes fires and where they break out. The reports tell the story. The trouble spots are arcs, or brake shoe sparks, igniting oil. Sump fires in engines. Generators, shorted or overloaded circuits. Loose traction motor leads, creating high resistance. Preventive coil, transformer, and switch group areas on electrics. Those are the main trouble spots. Yet we have plenty of mechanical troubleshooters. First, we have detector devices. And in each cab, alarms. Second, carbon dioxide and dry powder to fight fires. CO2 is ideal for the kind of fires we get. It will not damage the most sensitive railroad equipment. It has a high expansion ratio and penetrates every nook and corner. CO2, which you know in its solid state as dry ice, smothers fire by depriving it of oxygen. And third, we have specially designed pipe systems created to combat specific locomotive fires. Here's a typical installation found only on our road diesels. There are four 50-pound CO2 cylinders. They're coupled in pairs. When turned on, each pair provides 100 pounds of CO2. Four hose stations, each with 50 feet of hose and squeeze grip valve discharge horns. At each station, a direction valve must be opened to allow CO2 to pass through. Cylinders and hose stations are connected by a fixed pipe system. Each unit has eight remote control pull boxes. Four inside, four outside. All pull boxes are connected to the cylinders with cables so that there are two outside and two inside pull boxes for each pair of cylinders. When a fire occurs, a Fenwall thermostat trips the fire gong and light in the cab. After the train is stopped and the emergency fuel cutoff has been pulled, the fireman pulls any inside pull box. This releases CO2 from one pair of cylinders up to the directional valves at each hose station. He then selects the hose station most convenient to the fire area, throws the directional valve in a counterclockwise direction. This fills the hose with CO2 up to the squeeze grip control on the horn assembly. Then the horn can be carried to the fire where by squeezing the grip control, CO2 is discharged. Now, what happens if you exhaust your first two cylinders and you need more CO2? In that case, you pull any of the four remaining. And when in doubt about which one, pull them all. If things really get hot and you exhaust your CO2 in the first unit, you can get more by doing two things. One, pull at least two pull boxes in the next unit. Use your third and fourth unit supply if needed. Two. Throw the return flow valve here. CO2 will flow through the flexible connector to the horn already used in combating the fire. If a fire occurs in the electric cabinet, on most units we have built-in CO2 discharge nozzles. Pull any pull box near the cabinet. Then throw the directional valve counterclockwise. 